the previous lecture we looked at uh, different amplifying device which is the bipolar junction transistor. It is qualitatively similar to the MOS in that there are three terminals and the input is applied between base and emitter, the output uh, the control port is between collector and emitter. Okay. And the current from collector to emitter is primarily dependent on the base emitter voltage, but it also depends slightly on the collector emitter voltage. The main uh, difference between the bipolar and the MOS transistor is that this controlling port current, the equivalent of the gate current that is not 0, that imposes some limitations on uh, what circuits you can build. So, the model uh, in addition to GM and the output resistance will also contain a resistance on the input side. This is uh, by convention denoted by R5. And also because of the uh, dependence on uh, dependence of the collector current on the temperature for a constant VBE, if you do bias a bipolar transistor at a given VBE, it will result in electrothermal positive feedback and the device is likely to burn out. Okay. So, you never do this, the only uh, viable options for biasing a bipolar transistor are to bias it at a, a constant current, okay. use the constant current biasing. And that is what is shown here, the topologies look exactly the same as uh, for the MOS transistor. We have drain feedback here, where you uh, connect the current source to the collector and feed take a fe take feedback from collector to the base. It can be through some positive gain amplifier and you can connect a current source to the emitter that will adjust the emitter voltage until it carries the correct value of the emitter current. Okay. And there are also the other options where you can apply a current to the collector and feedback from collector to the emitter or you can apply a current to the source and feedback from source to base, I mean emitter and from uh, feedback from emitter to base. Okay. So, we can use all of these things and we will not discuss every obviously we cannot discuss every circuit to the same detail that we discuss with the MOS transistor. I will discuss some circuits and the main goal is to highlight the differences between what you can do with bipolar and what you can do with MOS. Okay. First let us start with this uh, circuit collector feedback biasing. We had done this with the MOS transistor as well. And one of the ways in which this was used was to realize a current mirror where you can replicate the current by replicating the gate source voltage across a number of identical devices. If you have matched devices, you can realize current mirrors. And if all these uh, MOS transistors are in saturation region, they will all be carrying a current I naught. Okay. Now, this is also used with bipolar transistors. Okay. Assuming that this is an active region, let us bias it at some uh, VCE greater than VCE sat. Then, what will be the current here? How much will be the current? Almost I naught, but not I naught. Hmm. How much will be the current? We see side. Just to say that it's an active region. What will be this current? Hmm? Slightly greater than I naught, why? No, no, okay. Let us not worry about the dependence of current on VCE. Let us assume that those curves are flat. Okay. What 
what should it be? I mean, why could it be different from I naught? Why would it be? Why? Some base current is uh, flowing out. Okay. So first of all, whatever this current is, I one. How much is this current? This current compared to this one. This current and this current. How much are they? Same. So this will also be I one. Okay. And what is this current here? What is that? I one by beta. And this one? Also I one by beta. Right? There is base current. That's the main differentiating uh, feature between this and a MOS transistor. So now, if you write Kirchhoff's current law at this node, you will get I naught to be equal to I one plus two times I one by beta. Okay. So actual current here I one is I naught divided by one plus two by beta. Okay. So it it will be different from I naught. Okay. So one uh, so that's one of the uh, differences between a MOS and a bipolar current meter. MOS gate doesn't draw any current at all. So first of all, this will be equal to I naught, and also I can have any number of devices here. Okay. I can replicate it any number of times. Now what happens if I do that here? If I go on chaining more and more bipolar transistors, huh? yeah, the base current, uh, base current will be drawn from I naught. Okay, so the part of that current, uh, that current will go on increasing. So the actual collector current will go on reducing. So you can't have a hundred transistors here. Okay, because then there'll be almost no current left for the collector current. If beta is let's say hundred or so. So, you also cannot have an unlimited number of devices. If you do want to have that, if you do want many uh, current sources, if you, if you do want many current sources, what do you have to, uh, what do you have to do? What can you do? So, one possibility is to buffer the voltage and you have to make sure that the current drawn by the buffer is negligible. Okay. And another possibility is you make a, a PNP, NPN current mirror and then mirror it to PNP and then I mean each current mirror should not have many devices, right. Maybe the each one should be limited to a few devices and then you have to have many such current mirrors. Okay. So, there are other possibilities you can use, but you should just be aware that there is this limitation. Okay. Any questions? So, the main difference is that because of the base current, the current output current will be slightly different from the input even if there is no dependence on the collector emitter voltage and on top of it you cannot have an unlimited number of devices connected to the current mirror. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So, now similarly you will be able to analyze by yourself what happens because of the base current in every circuit. The important thing is to remember that there is base current. Okay. Now, let us take this emitter feedback. Which is the equivalent of source feedback. Okay. And we saw that lot of the uh, amplifiers that we designed, single transistor amplifiers starting from the common source amplifier and also many current sources, they use this source feedback bias, right. And similarly, emitter feedback bias is very popular as well. And I will call this VDD, but uh, in many cases, the supply voltage on the collector side for a bipolar transistor, it is called VCC, whatever it is, it is some fixed voltage. Now, this has to be biased at 
some fixed voltage. That's the starting point for all our amplifiers, right? Okay. So how do we derive that fixed voltage? Vg zero or Vb zero? What did we do before? Resistive divide. Okay. So we use a resistive divider. Okay, now uh, are there any differences between the two? Base will draw current, whereas here this current was 0. So, what was this voltage? R2 by R1 plus R2 times VDD. Now, what will be the voltage here? Be that voltage? Please calculate. Yeah. What is I? How much is that? Yeah. So this current here, the emitter current is I naught. So this is I naught by beta plus one. But this is okay. I think if you set the Set I naught by beta here, right, that would be fine also. Okay, it's a small error. So, what will be this voltage? Hmm? Will it be more than this or less than this? Less than this. Some current is drawn out of that. So, how much is that voltage? Yeah. So, essentially, the picture we have is that of VDD with a resistive divider and a current that is being drawn out okay and you can solve this by superposition if you set vdd to 0 you see that this current is drawn from parallel combination of r1 and r2 okay this is minus i naught by beta plus 1 times r1 parallel r2 okay so what what does this do fine the voltage is slightly different okay Voltage is different from uh, what you intended it to be. What is the consequence of this? What's that? I mean, the question is uh, does it impose any? Uh, so, do you have to design the bipolar amplifier any differently than the uh, any differently than the MOS amplifier? Okay. R1, R2 cannot be very large, okay. Because so one thing to keep in mind is that this beta, its nominal value is given, okay. So let us say 100 or something, but it is a kind of crude approximation. Beta itself depends on the uh, current levels, correct collector current, and so on. It also depends quite strongly on temperature, okay. So you will be given some sort of uh, minimum guaranteed value of beta, but not the exact value of beta that you would not know, okay. So uh, the first thing you would uh, try to do if beta was accurately known is set the R1 and R2 ratio differently, right. If you want, if this was uh, 10 volts and if you, this was 3 volts, you do not set it in a 3 to 7 ratio. You set it, you set it to give uh, slightly more voltage here and after the subtracting this, you will get the correct 3 volts. But you cannot do that because you cannot rely on the value of beta to be very accurate, okay. So, if this product happens to be very large, that kind of correction will not work because as beta varies, this varies by a large amount and the bias will vary and so on. So, that is not acceptable. So, the only reliable way of biasing is to make the second term small to begin with, okay. And the way to make it small is to choose moderately small values of R1 and R2, okay. So, you can't choose very large values of R1 and R2 while biasing a bipolar transistor. ratio to be some desired value, right. Let us say you want a 3 volt bias and VDD is something. So, you want the ratio to be uh, 
some uh, known value i mean yeah true if one is very small that will set the parallel combination but you also want the ratio to be something so that basically means in general that r1 and r2 both have to be quite small okay So clearly, I mean, if the base current is in microamperes, you can't use R1 and R2 in microohms, right? Because the product will be in volts. So you'll have some uh, huge uncertainty in the base voltage. Is this okay? So that uh, base current imposes some restrictions on the uh, uh, biasing resistor values in a bipolar transistor. This is true for every circuit. In fact, if you remember, we use this for uh, common emitter amplifier or common source amplifier and three of the four control sources, right? Uh, source follower and uh, voltage controlled current source and current control current source. So, in all those cases, you have to choose R1 and R2 that are not very, very large. Okay. So, fine. Now, you can't choose R1 and R2 to be very large. Does it have any consequence? Signal attenuation. So, why did we want to make R1 and R2 very large? When we apply the signal, okay. So here, this is like a voltage division between RS and R1 parallel R2, okay. And we want the division ratio to be very close to one. So R1 and R2 should be much greater than RS. That's why we were obsessed with keeping R1 and R2 very large. But now we can't do that. So that means that we have to live with the signal attenuation, okay. So, in other words, the input resistance of this amplifier, whatever amplifier you make with this, that will have R1 parallel R2 in it, okay. So, now the input resistance cannot be very large, okay. So, that is another limitation of having to use bipolar transistors, okay. The common source amplifier is obviously called the common emitter amplifier when you make it with bipolar transistor. Similarly, common gate and common drain are called common base and common collector amplifiers. Okay. All other things remain the same. Anything else we need to do for a common emitter amplifier? Is this complete? Something missing. What is that? Hmm? So the emitter should be at small signal or incremental ground. So we also need to have this. Okay. So now what is the small signal equivalent circuit of this? What will be the gain? Please evaluate it. Assume that all capacitors are shorts. That part I won't cover again because I think they are essentially the same thing that we had earlier, the constraints and so on, okay, with a very small difference. But assume that they are large enough to be shorts. So please draw the small signal model and find the gain. So what I want is small signal V0 by Vi, okay. If you draw the small signal model, this is what you see. You have everything is the same V i, R s, and you have R 1 parallel R 2. The only additional thing with the bipolar transistor is this resistance R pi that appears between base and emitter. Huh? Yeah, of course you can. So, this is GM VBE 
and you have the output resistance R naught and R C and R L and so on. So, the only extra stuff is here ok that is all. So, whenever you evaluate the uh, for instance the capacitor C 1 appears here. So, in the constraint for capacitor C 1 you will also have R pi ok. So, V naught by V i you can write it very simply as minus G m and here you will have parallel combination of R C, R L and R naught and here you will have voltage division which is this parallel combination plus R S ok. So, first of all R 1 and R 2 themselves are uh, not very large and even if you somehow made them very large R pi will still be there ok. So, in general you will always suffer from some uh, attenuation here ok. Yeah, uh, you can assume them to be similar to uh, what we had uh, in case of the bipolar transistors ok. So, we have this is usually known as C pi and this is known as C mu for some historical reasons and there will be some capacitance there as well. So, between every pair of terminals there will be a capacitor just like in the most transistor case ok. This is fine and this will appear in every circuit. For instance, you can make a, I mean it is a bigger disadvantage in circuits like a source follower because or in this case it is called the emitter follower. What kind of circuit is an emitter follower? What is its role? Hmm? Voltage control voltage source or a voltage buffer. So, the idea is it should present a very high input resistance and a very small output resistance ok. This is fine. So, now you can see why this R 1 and R 2 is a big limitation. R 1 and R 2 is limited in the same way as before right because to keep the bias insensitive to variations in beta you have to choose R 1 and R 2 to be small. So, now you have a situation where you do have a buffer, but you cannot keep this resistance to be very high ok. In fact, just as an exercise do not do it now, but you can take it later. Find out the input resistance looking into the base and also the resistance looking back into the emitter, the input and output resistances ok. And you can neglect the inherent output conductance of the transistor that is not the important thing, there is something else here that will be important ok. So, you can see what that is going to be. So, in general at the base you cannot use very large resistors and looking into the base you cannot see a very high input resistance simply because the inherent input resistance of a MOS transistor is infinite whereas, that of a bipolar transistor is R pi ok. So, that will reflect in every circuit for some circuits it matters for some circuits like the common base amplifier it is not such a such an important thing ok. But again if you know the small signal model you can always put it into the circuit and analyze it ok. I have highlighted a couple of cases where clearly there is a big difference. Any questions about this? It appears that ok we have this device bipolar transistor and it has only seems to have disadvantages. What might be the use of a bipolar transistor? Why would we want to use it in the day of CMOS MOS transistor? Yeah, why? Huh? 
actually not necessarily in fact it is uh, the collector capacitance is many times bigger also of course that depends on the size ok because uh, I mean now this is it is not clear whether it is an inherent property of uh, bipolar transistors or just that MOS transistors have been so good that we put more effort into developing it. The smallest MOS transistor is much smaller than the smallest bipolar. So, capacitors also will be smaller. Huh? Speed, yeah, that is what I said, right? Frequency, high frequency, speed, it is the same thing. It is that, but let us see. So, let us imagine a bipolar transistor biased at I naught and also I naught here I mean collector current of I naught, but let us not worry about the beta now ok the difference between collector and emitter current. Now, what is the transconductance of this? What is the expression for the transconductance? We evaluated that right what is that? I see by yeah, so it is I naught by V t where V t is the thermal voltage ok. What is the expression for G m of the MOS transistor? Yeah, so many expressions we have, but of a similar form of the form of I naught divided by some voltage what is that? Yeah, so it is I naught divided by V g s minus V t by 2 ok. So, now can you tell me there is some advantage to using the bipolar transistor? Yeah. So, what is the value of V t? I naught by 25 millivolts, let us say 26 or whatever. And what is the value of V g s minus V t? It is variable, but if you want to operate the transistor in strong inversion, it has to be more than 150 milli 150 millivolts or so, ok. And uh, so, let us say it is 200 millivolts ok, usually that is kind of considered the limit of strong inversion. So, in that case this will be I naught by 100 millivolts. So, you can see that uh, to get a certain GM you have to burn a lot more current in a MOS transistor than in a bipolar transistor ok. Now, in uh, general if you go to high frequency circuits you will have to operate the transistors at a small GM ok, because the pole frequencies, the critical pole frequencies will be of the form G m by C. Like for instance, one thing you can recall is the uh, unity gain frequency of an operational amplifier which is G m 1 divided by the capacitor ok. So, you have to in general you have to use uh, if you go to if you want to scale up to higher and higher frequencies, you have to use larger transconductances, smaller resistances, uh, higher conductances and so on ok and smaller capacitances. So, this is why uh, and also I mean even uh, otherwise if you want to bias a transistor at a given GM you have to burn less current in a bipolar transistor. So, some certain analog functions you can realize with a much lower power consumption if you have bipolar transistors than if you have MOS transistors ok. So, that is the advantage of it and that is why it is sometimes still used ok. So, this is a positive for high frequency circuits or low power analog circuits ok. Now, the digital gates made using bipolar transistors they consume a lot of power whereas, the CMOS digital gates consume no static power and they consume much smaller power than bipolar. That is why they became so popular to begin with, but this is not necessarily true for analog circuits ok. So, MOS does not necessarily mean low power. So, you can have lower power with bipolar transistors than with MOS transistors ok. Yeah, so I will come to that. Uh, you cannot make an inverter like that ok. So, that I will also show it is a good question, but yeah we do have a complementary device. Any questions about this? These highlight the main differences. Now, if you see any uh, circuit with bipolar of course, by throwing the small signal model you should be able to uh, analyze anything, 
Okay, keep in mind that I mean obviously don't omit R pi, right? That's the most important thing in the picture. I mean most important differentiating uh, feature between MOS and bipolar transistors. And also if you evaluate this, you will see some interesting stuff if you evaluate the RI and RO of this, okay. What was it in the MOS case? What was the value of RI? Infinity. What was RO? Yeah, let us forget GDS. So, MOS RI was infinity, RO was 1 by GM. So, please evaluate it for the bipolar and find out, okay. So, now, uh, so what I have highlighted are uh, major differences and yeah, biasing, we cannot use constant voltage biasing, you have to use constant one of the constant current biasing techniques and uh, you also have to make sure that whatever is driving the base can supply the base current, okay. That is the circuit that is driving the base will have its own feminine resistance that has to be small enough so that the base current does not cause a big drop. Basically in the specific case that we took R1 and R2 had to be very small so that I0 by beta times R1 parallel R2 is a small voltage, okay. So those things you have to take care of. After that in the small signal picture R pi will appear in parallel with something and it will have some effects, okay. Yeah, you can do that, but that buffer will be another emitter follower which will have its own, okay. In fact, uh, that combination was also quite popular with uh, bipolar transistor. So, the you have a bipolar transistor and then the point is this needs a current, okay. So, if there is some current I naught here, this will be I naught by beta, okay. So, now that may be too much both in the large signal biasing sense and also in the small signal sense you will see R pi, okay. So, a buffer was used and what is the buffer you can use? Another emitter follower, okay. Now, this emitter follower it is not biased with another current, okay. The base current of this biases that also. So, this is now operating with a current I naught by beta. So, what is this current? I naught by beta square, okay. So, now you can see that this is a much smaller current and similarly you can also see, you can also calculate the small signal resistance looking into this and it will be much smaller. And for uh, various reasons just to come up with an equivalent like a transistor, these two collectors were tied together and this whole thing was called or used like a single transistor and it was known as the Darlington pair after the person who first proposed it, okay. So, this is uh, I mean this is a useless thing with MOS transistors because uh, in MOS anyway the input resistance is infinite, you do not need all this, okay. But with the bipolar stuff this can be quite useful and it is sometimes used. So, you can think of this as there is a slight difference this is not connected to the supply voltage as it would be in an emitter follower, but I will still call this an emitter follower driving a transistor, okay. And you can also I mean you can uh, decide to go with one more stage if you want then you get a base current of I naught by beta cube and so on. If you have YC MOS, yeah, sure. If you have both in the same process, okay. In general, uh, there is a certain uh, process steps that you need for bipolar transistors and a set of different, I mean, you need a different set of steps for bipolar. If you combine, uh, you will need more steps, okay. You need some sort of union. Now, it turns out that the cost of YC fabrication is in making the masks, okay. So, the way, I mean, very crudely what you do is you take a silicon wafer and you place a glass plate on it with some patterns and then you do what you want with it, okay. That is you shoot uh, ions, I mean you must have heard terms like ion implantation and all these things, right and doping with P type, N type and uh, patterning of metals and so on there is. Uh, uh, so, that is what you do, you shine light on it, it is a very sophisticated process now, but uh, you shine light on it, remove some parts, etch some things. The whole thing is planar, you build it layer by layer and the number of uh, different masks 
that is number of different processing steps you need that is what mainly decides the cost ok. So, if you have uh, now and the CMOS process is quite complicated. So, some of you may take some elective next semester which will uh, show you the basic CMOS process which has some 6 masks or something to make the N and regions and the poly gate and all these things, but the actual CMOS process today has some 35 or 40 masks ok. If you have a bipolar uh, process also added to it you will have more masks and it will increase the cost ok. So, all these things you use only when necessary that is the bottom line ok. And the cost of uh, these things are substantial we are uh, talking about millions of dollars like several crores for making a single wafer of uh, but the point is I mean once you make the masks you can make any number of wafers with it ok. So, that is why all these mobile phones everything become very cheap after a while right because uh, mass production I mean it takes some money to make one chip it takes almost the same amount of money to make like 100,000 chips I mean it is not uh, does not scale with the number of chips ok. So, uh, you can make I mean there are lots of other uh, things that you can make I mean you can have additional devices and so on, but each of these as you go on adding different masks you can roughly uh, compute the cost as being proportional to the number of masks ok. It is not exactly that there are other things, but now I think this part you already know there is the opposite polarity device of the NPN transistor. This is a collector base emitter and the physical construction of this looks something like this. I mean this is not a planar device ok. On an IC this is not how a device will look, but this is used the usual representation that is used N P and N right. This is the base emitter and collector and this is equivalent to the qualitatively equivalent to the NMOS transistor. And similarly, there is what is known as a PNP transistor. You have seen this, right? I have seen it in the devices course. PNP transistor. Yeah. So, all you do is interchange P and N. So, you have N type base, this is the base collector and emitter, and, and I am drawing the emitter on top, keeping with my convention of putting the higher voltage on top and lower voltage on the bottom. So, we have V E B here and V E C. The current is primarily dependent on V E B and slightly dependent on V E C and this is equivalent to the PMOS transistor ok. And the collector current flows out of the collector just like the drain current flows out of the drain ok. So, you use it just like you do uh, the PMOS transistor and just like with NMOS transistor this I C is an exponential function of V E B. and it has a slight linear dependence on V E C ok. Now, just like also with the N P N transistor what you uh, do is for hand calculations you assume that V E B is uh, 0.7 volts when it is on or some fixed voltage that is given to you. Yeah, it will be outside. So, everything will be opposite ok. So, if this is I C this current will be I C by beta and this current will be I C times beta plus 1 by beta ok. So, in case of uh, NPN transistors, I think you know this. So, electrons are injected into the base and then they shoot into the collector. And similarly, in case of PNP, electrons shoot from uh, uh, sorry, holes shoot from uh, 
uh, emitter to the base and then they also go through to the collector. Question he was asking, I mean we can make a CMOS inverter like this. This is the basis for all the CMOS gates, okay. If you want uh, gates with uh, more inputs, each of these this PMOS will be uh, replaced by parallel or series combination of PMOS and NMOS will be replaced by parallel or series combination of NMOS, okay. So, essentially based on this you can make any logic gate that you want, okay. That is another advantage you do not need multiple stages like let us say you want uh, you want to realize a function like A times B or C, you can do it with a single stage with some exception maybe you will be able to realize the inverted form of this. So, you have to have a CMOS inverter following that, but besides that you can do you can realize all logic functions with a single stage that is not so with bipolar and you can also cannot make this with bipolar. So, let us say we try to mimic that. Could we do this or why could we not do this? Okay, let us say that is fine, meaning the previous gate can drive whatever current is required. Base current? No, no, I mean if I leave it like this, if I just realize the circuit, it has to be right by Kirchhoff's current law that current has to be equal to that current the transistor has to move into the right region of operation for that to happen ok. I mean you cannot really make this because uh, first of all I mean forget the digital gate for a moment imagine the self bias case ok. So, in the self bias CMOS what was the dependence of uh, this current on the supply voltage? So, it was VDD minus some sum of threshold voltages square. What do you guess it will be here? No, why would it be square? It will be exponentially related to VCC. So, you just cannot use this, ok. So, the current will be completely out of control. The same thing will happen here. What happens is that when the so when VI is low, ok, when VI is connected to ground, which regions are the transistors in? M P and M N, what region is M P in? So, V naught will go up to V D D, M P will be in triode, ok. Now, you can and nothing the point is nothing happens to the gate, the gate is still drawing 0 current, ok. If you do this with a bipolar, ok, what happens is that this will go up and this will enter the bipolar saturation region that is a small V E C region, ok. Once you do that essentially this base current increases out of control, ok. So, this is like you are applying VCC across a p n junction, you cannot do that right. The amount of voltage you can apply across a forward bias p n junction is limited, ok, because of the exponential characteristic. If you do try to apply a larger voltage, what happens is the current will go out of control and somehow destroy the device. So, now this is if you look at this, we had p n p and we have this connected to VCC and this connected to ground. So, across this base emitter junction you have VCC, ok. So, that will cause first of all a very large current to flow here and it will also destroy the device. So, you cannot use it, you cannot use this circuit at all, ok. So, now uh, I would not show every possible circuit with the PNP, I mean just like you can convert every uh, NMOS circuit to PMOS by what do you have to do? How do you convert NMOS circuits to PMOS? 
reverse the you first substitute all uh, NMOS with PMOS and PMOS with NMOS. I mean that will reverse the polarities of all transistors and you have to reverse the polarities of all uh, sources independent sources that set the bias. They could be current sources, they could be voltage sources and then by convention you draw the circuit upside down that is all that is ok. So, I would not show this for uh, every circuit, but I will show one circuit that we have made. that is the differential pair with a current mirror load. It looks exactly like the MOS counterpart. For some reason the transistors used to be labeled Q, I do not know why, I mean bipolar transistors. And then you have VCM plus V D by 2 and V I C M minus V D by 2 here, ok. And this comes from a current mirror. So, this is a single stage op amp, and you can also make two stage op amp by following this with a PNP common emitter amplifier. Okay. That is fine. So, this is a two stage op amp and just like with the MOS 1 you have to stabilize it using a capacitor CC and you can also have a buffer after this and so on. So, all the all those circuits are very much possible ok. What do you think will be the essential difference between this op amp and the MOS op amp? What is that? Input resistance yeah obviously in the MOS case the input resistance was infinite now it will not be what will it be? The differential input resistance what I want is the voltage applied across the op amp divided by the current that is drawn from it. How much will that be? Hmm? R pi by 2, why? It will be 2 R pi, ok. So, across this you will have an incremental signal of V d by 2 and here another V d by 2, ok. So, across R pi you have V d by 2. So, the current drawn from it will be V d by 2 R pi. So, everything else that we did will hold except that the input resistance will be 2 R pi, ok. In fact, this is a place where you might want to use the Darlington pair or basically another buffer so that the input resistance is boosted up, ok. What is the effect of input resistance of the op amp? What happens if the, so let us say loss of signal. So, let us say I have this. And let us assume that the gain of the op amp is quite high. So, we do not have to worry about that factor. So, what will be? First of all, let us assume a MOS op amp with a large gain. What will be V naught? Huh? K times V i. So, now I substitute this with a bipolar transistor op amp, ok. What will happen? Virtual short is lost. Why? So, essentially that is like, so I will have this right across that. How much current will it draw? approximately what would this voltage be in case of a MOS op amp? What is that? K times V i divided by A naught where A naught is the gain of the op amp. Okay. 
So, now one way of uh, calculating which is I mean you can call cheating or clever approximation is when you make small changes to the circuit you assume that this part of the solution has not changed and then you calculate it and this is also I mean you can call this perturbation expansion or use whatever fancy term you want. But uh, from that you start calculating and then add corrections successive corrections. So, let us assume that this voltage is the same about the same as before ok. So, what will be this current if I have 2 r pi over there what is the current that is drawn from here k v i by 2 r pi times a naught basically whatever is the input resistance of the op amp that will appear there. Now, this could still be very small depending on the value of a naught ok. So, the input resistance of an op amp is not necessarily a catastrophic thing it will make a difference because now it will cause some drop ok. So, roughly speaking instead of getting V i here what is the value you get V i minus R s by R n where R n for this particular case is 2 R pi times K V i by A naught ok. So, depending on the value of A naught this could still be close to V i. So, the circuit can still function more or less normally. So, it is not true that the virtual short is lost because what is the key aspect of the op amp that makes the virtual short possible infinite gain ok. So, that is why you need to have a very large gain if you do have infinite gain this is even irrelevant because the day naught is infinity and there is no difference at all right you get all of V i there. But uh, if only uh, a naught is not infinity it is a bonus to have a large input resistance ok. The same for output resistance I think uh, you must have seen this in one of the previous tutorials right. Okay, so we will continue from there tomorrow.